All right, so let's look at a more interesting uh, probabilistic question that we can use Monte Carlo simulations to help us answer. Uh, and so I wanna keep the question simple. Uh, so we're not trying to look at some complicated application, uh, but we'll see that even simple questions do take a little bit of work uh, to, to simulate. So the question we'll look at is what is the expected or average number of coin flips before you obtain a sequence of three heads, okay? And so we're gonna try to write a program to simulate coin flips until we get three heads, and then we'll try to uh, count up basically how often or how long did it take to get three heads on average over many, many simulations. So as a general outline, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to one, simulate coin flips, okay? Uh, and once we've done that, we're going to need to count the number of consecutive heads. Right? And so if we're flipping and we get heads, heads, at that point we would say we have two consecutive heads, but if we get a tails, we should probably reset the zero, and we don't want to stop until the count of consecutive heads gets up to three. All right? Uh, we also will need to remember the total number of flips. so that when we actually do get three heads, we can figure out how many flips did it take. And then we want to be able to repeat the experiment many times. And the definition of many is gonna vary uh, depending on the context, but often something like 1,000 to 10,000 experiments uh, is going to be required to get a really reliable estimate for the probability. And it also is going to depend on how rare is the event that you're trying to describe. In this case, uh, this is not going to be particularly hard, so we'll probably get a pretty good estimate within three to a, uh, within 100 to, to 1,000 uh, experiments. Uh, but for some more complicated and rare events, you might need to do 10,000 or even more experiments. All right, so this is going to be, uh, we're going to do this live. So we're going to start with a blank uh, script. And let me just start with the comments. We want to estimate the average number of coin flips before getting uh, three consecutive heads. All right, and so we'll start by just creating uh, the program to simulate a single uh, experiment, and then we'll, we'll worry about trying to repeat that later on. All right, so let's remember, uh, we first need to to simulate a coin flip. And so let me define a variable P for the probability of heads. And in this case, we'll set it to one half, but we'll, I like to leave those things as parameters because if we want to then change our experiment so that we use a weighted coin, we could uh, easily just change one value and then the program will still work. All right, so that's probability of heads. Okay, and we can simulate a coin flip by saying uh, R equals rand. So that generates a random number. And then we'd say if r is less than p, uh, and then let me just use x as the outcome, and I'll, I'm going to use 1 for heads. And if it's not, I will say that x is equal to 0 for tails. OK? And uh, Let's see, so that would be a single coin flip. And so at the end of executing this code, X would either have a value one or zero, and one would come up with probability P, uh, zero would come up with probability one minus P. All right, so that's a single coin flip. What we wanna do is not one coin flip, but we wanna do many coin flips. And so we could do that by putting this in a loop. And so uh, there are two types of loops. Up to this point, we've primarily used the type of loop called a for loop. And in a for loop, you repeat some command a fixed number of times. But here, we don't know how many coin flips we need to use because we don't know how long it's going to take to get three consecutive heads. And so we use a different type of loop called a while loop. And so we'll continue while, uh, let's say, let's call it head count, while the number of consecutive heads is less than three. As long as we have don't have three heads in a row, we'll want to compete, continue repeating our coin flips. But, uh, 
once we get three heads, we'd like to stop. Okay. And so let me put this in a little loop. All right. And so now this is going to try to repeat our coin flips many, many, many times. Uh, and if once we get the code finished, that will actually work quite well. But there's a problem right now, and that is uh, I can't check to see if head count is less than three if head count doesn't exist. And so before I've started my experiment, I will need to define the variable head count. And we'll say when we start, we don't have any heads yet. All right. So that's good. Uh, but we also should make sure that we update the value of head count in the loop. And so uh, if I go in here, really, I don't care so much about what the last value was. I just care about keeping track of how many heads I have thus far. And so what I'll do is I'll say, uh, if r is less than p, which I, means I get heads, I will add one to head count. And you can do that using a line like this that says, take the old value of head count, add one to it, and now save it as head count. And if head count, uh, if I get tails, then I should reset the head count back to zero. And so at the end of this, uh, I should get uh, the the head count will go you know up, up, up every time I get heads, it'll drop down to zero. And then once it eventually reaches the value of three, this uh, start of the loop will will be uh, well, it'll be false, right? Head count will no longer be less than three. And at that point, it will stop. And so the value of head count will be three at the end. All right, so uh, hopefully if you have done some programming before, this doesn't come as too much as, as, as too much of a surprise. If this is relatively new to you, uh, this is something where you may, may want to go back and kind of rewatch this video a couple of times to understand the logic here. Uh, but we'll press on. Uh, there's one concern about this loop that we've written, and that is we're not really interested in head count. What we want is to keep track of the number of flips. All right, and so I'm gonna create a new variable called flip count which has the value zero. And then every time I flip a coin, I'm going to add one to it. So that when I finish the loop, this variable will store the total number of flips. All right, so increase count. And I like to put comments in to make sure my code makes sense to me when I look at it later on. So when I get a heads, I should increase uh, head count by one. And when I get tails, I should reset head count to zero. Okay, so that looks good. Let's run this. And uh, I'm going to take some semicolons off so that you can actually see the value of head count and flip count during the loop. Uh, if you leave, put semicolons on, it doesn't display anything. It just does the calculation and stores it. All right, so here's my coin flip experiment. And we'll run that. And you see, okay, so we'll scroll back up. When we started, it said flip count is one, head count is one. I must have got head in the first one. Then on the second flip, I'm, I updated my flip count to two, but head count go to zero, it went to zero, so I must have flipped the tails. Uh, then I got uh, head count went up to one, to two, back to zero, to one, to zero, 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 zero. So I got a bunch of tails in a row, but still haven't had my three heads in a row. And I don't actually get up to head count equals three until the 23rd flip. And so in this first experiment, I took 23 flips to uh, get three heads in a row. Now, one experiment is not enough to estimate the average number. And so what we would now want to do is repeat this multiple times. And so, so I will use a for loop for this. I'll say for, uh, let's say we want to do uh, number of experiments is 100. So for k equals one to num experiments, I will repeat this command. And indentation is a useful thing for just understanding the flow of code. So I always like to have my ends aligned up with my fours. Now, if I did this, I would run the experiment 100 times, but I would just keep overwriting the results from the previous experiment each time. And that's not good. We want to actually keep track of things. And so what we're interested in is flip count. And so uh, I'll cr create a vector called results, and it's going to be an empty vector. Uh, and then I'll just say uh, results of n plus 1, which means take the last value and then move over one spot. Uh, and we would like to assign to that location the flip count from the experiment. 
Okay, and now uh, let me put semicolons back in so we don't need to see all the intermediate results. And at the end, I can just I'll just display my results vector. And what we'll see is we should get 100 numbers, which represent the number of flips that it took on each of the 100 experiments. And we do that and say, OK, look, oh, it only took five the first time to get three heads, uh, 10, three, three, four, five. Uh, sometimes it took as many. It looks like we had a 42 at one point, 46. Uh, so one time we got heads right off the bat three times. And so uh, based on these numbers, we actually want the average. And so we could say the, the average number uh, of flips is just the mean of results. And there's a function built into MATLAB and Octave called mean, which will compute the average from a vector. And we could then, let me rerun this, so we'll get a slightly different outcome. And it says that the average was about 13.96 flips. All right. So that's the average. Another way that we could look at these results is we could apply a histogram. And I'm going to actually, instead of doing 100 experiments, I'm going to turn that up to 1,000. And this will give us a nice, a little bit cleaner picture. And so if I type HIST for histogram, parentheses, results, which is the vector with the outcomes, it will display this. And uh, just to make sense of this, the x-axis is always the outcome. So this is the number of flips. Uh, and then the y-axis is the number of times that event occurred. And so it looks like the way it's dividing it up here uh, is that in the low range from 3 up to maybe maybe 13 or so, uh, it happened about five between 5 and 600 times. We, we got our three heads in the first 13 flips. Uh, between 13 and 23, uh, that we, we, we got our first three heads between 13 and 23 flips in around 250 times and it was rare but sometimes it took us even more than 60 flips. Now when you generate a plot like this I like to clean it up by adding some labels so this would be uh, the x-axis would be number of flips and the y label would be the frequency and then you can also if you want to uh, you can give it a list of bins. So in this case, I'm going to do, I want my bins to be divided up with, with uh, maybe, well, I'll just give it the number of bins. Let's say I want to have 50 bins. So uh, that's going to be the number of bars that show up on the plot. As it was, it was very coarse grain. And so, um, in fact, let's, let's do, uh, how about the max of results? So we've got one bin for each number. And where's our plot in the background? OK, and now you can see it kind of has a single bar for each different outcome. So uh, getting three flips happened around 130 times. Getting it in four flips happened around 70 times, and so on. OK, so that's a nice way of looking at the outcomes of our experiment. Now notice the average 13 is definitely not the middle of the distribution, right? There are is, is very long tail here of outcomes that are bigger than 13. But uh, th th it is the average value, which means if you were to just, again, take up all these 1,000 numbers from our experiments, add them up, and divide by 1,000, that is what you would get. Now, this differs from the median of the distribution. The median is if you were to, say, line up all of these outcomes from smallest to largest, what would be the one right in the middle? Uh, in this case, uh, that would be adding up the, the lengths of the bars until you get to half of the number of experiments. And I suspect that we would see that that's probably a little bit different than 13.7. In fact, I believe there's, there's probably a function in Octave for this. Let's see if that works. Aha! In this case, the median is 10. So it looks like half of the time we got our three coin flips in uh, less than 10 and half the time in, in more than 10. All right. So that's uh, an example of using uh, Octave to simulate a non-trivial random process. And we had to do that using a loop to uh, repeat our coin flips. We used ifs, else's, and ends to determine when would the event that we were interested in occurred. Uh, and then we used another loop to actually repeat our experiment many times so that we could then compute means or histograms of the results. And that's often what you're going to want to do with a random process is either compute some sort of average 
or visualize a probability distribution.